At the end of the 19th century, advances in metallurgy and mass production had made bridge building on the grand scale possible. With the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883, a new era of bridge design and engineering began. The men who designed and built these structures were seen as romantic figures whose efforts would enhance, beautify, and bring the city of New York closer together. In 1897, bridge engineer L.L. Buck designed the first of these great landmark structures built in the 20th century, the new East River Bridge, soon to be renamed the Williamsburg Bridge. The New York State Legislature required that the new structure be a suspension bridge, carry elevated trains, and have roadways for both carriages and pedestrians. At the time of its completion, the Williamsburg Bridge was an engineering marvel. It was the longest suspension bridge in the world, built in half the time and costing less than the Brooklyn Bridge, while capable of carrying twice the weight. On December 19, 1903, opening ceremonies took place for the Williamsburg Bridge. After officials from Manhattan and Brooklyn met in the middle of the bridge, Mayor Seth Lowe led them to a podium at the Brooklyn Plaza, where bridge commissioner Gustav Lindenthal presented the bridge to the city. In his speech, the commissioner said that with the Williamsburg Bridge, New York was destined to become the largest city in the history of mankind. And he added, if the bridge is protected from corrosion, its only deadly enemy, it will stand for hundreds of years. Manhattan and Brooklyn were now further linked, and the city of New York was on its way to becoming the great metropolis of the 20th century. It wouldn't be long, however, before the bridge's deadly enemy made itself known. As early as 1910, the ungalvanized cable wires, which were used to save money, began to corrode and break. Over the years, attempts were made to control corrosion, such as pouring raw linseed oil over the cable wires. In 1985, an engineering consulting firm conducted a study which concluded that the corrosion and wire breakage was widespread, leaving the four main cables significantly weakened. Their solution called for the replacement of all four cables. This would mean closing the bridge for years. In June of 1987, the outer roadways had to be narrowed in order to relieve the load on the cables. A month earlier, a section of the bridge had fallen into the East River. When approached for funding by the New York City and State Departments of Transportation, the Federal Highway Administration offered an even more drastic solution. Replace the Williamsburg Bridge with a new bridge. The federal government, uh, which is a major funder of the Williamsburg Bridge, did not want to uh, just simply rebuild the existing bridge. They wanted us to look at a new bridge. The state and city wanted to um, rebuild the existing bridge. That dispute simmered for uh, probably two years before I got here. And uh, there was, didn't seem to be any way to break that log jam. Uh, so uh, when we first uh, realized the serious nature of the, of the condition of the Williamsburg Bridge, and we realized we had to break the log jam, uh, we formed the Technical Advisory Committee, and we started that in, uh, I guess, the spring of, uh, of 87. And by August, uh, we had it fully formed, and it was announced by the mayor on the bridge itself. 
and we are announcing the formation of a 10-member technical advisory committee to determine if the Williamsburg Bridge, which is plagued by deteriorating cables, can be reconstructed and repaired, or if it has to be replaced. First Deputy Commissioner and Chief Engineer of the New York City Department of Transportation, Samuel I. Schwartz, was chosen to head the Technical Advisory Committee. So the Technical Advisory Committee had to answer those questions. Can you construct this type of bridge? Can you do it with a minimum amount of disruption? Does it make sense? Or should you, build, should you just rehabilitate the existing bridge? And can the existing bridge be saved? Can it last 100 years? We didn't want a bridge that'll just make it to the year 2000. We want a bridge that will last till 2100 or beyond. And uh, that helped clarify uh, the answers that we came up with. We were very deliberate in our selection of panel members. Uh, first of all, we wanted all to be engineers. Every single pan panel member was a registered professional engineer. That was very important to us because uh, it was technical questions that we had to answer, whether the bridge can be reconstructed. These were questions that uh, a lay person really wouldn't have the expertise in. And we ended up with, I think, probably the finest panel we could have gotten in the world of leading experts. Uh, the vice chairman was Forster Beach, uh, who was the regional director from New York State, a professional engineer in uh, construction technology. We had uh, Machi Bienik from Columbia University, who offered a good deal of expertise in terms of the steel, the steel and the wires, the properties of steel. John Fisher, who's world-renowned in structural steel failure, and has written probably the books on structural steel fatigue and stress and corrosion. John Kozak, who was from California Transportation Department and had worked on many big bridge uh, projects, including Golden Gate. He had the practical knowledge of having been in an operating agency. Dick Simberg, who was the chief engineer of the state and lended a great deal of credibility to our work. We had Norman Sollenberger, probably the senior man member of our panel from Princeton University, uh, George Zanlazzini from the city, who was probably the most hands-on uh, fellow in, in the last few years, and he had been deeply involved with the Williamsburg Bridge, was Hartley Daniels, who also was a great help to the panel. And uh, Hartley was, uh, helped clarify things for us, especially in, in, in the language when we wanted to be clear to the public and to others. Bill Hayde from the Transit Authority, uh, who represented uh, their point of view. Very often uh, we think about the bridge and the eight lanes, but there were two tracks on the bridge. Jim Azafaro, who's the chief engineer of the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority. The last big bridges built in, in the region were built by the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority. I'd say uh, that of the 10 engi engineers, we had probably 400 years worth of engineering experience. We had two simultaneous tracks. One was learning about the bridge, the problems of the existing bridge, and the second track was to try to generate interest in the bridge community worldwide in designing a new bridge. As the Technical Advisory Committee studied the existing structure, firms from all over the world responded immediately to the challenge of designing a new bridge for the city of New York. Designers from around the world sent in ideas for a new bridge and today they showed off their work. Over the next few months, we'll be doing a comprehensive evaluation of all these design concepts by the engineers of the Technical Advisory Committee and its consultant, Howard Needles, Tamman, and Bergendorf. In addition, they'll be carefully reviewed with the community. Among the ideas, a top of the bridge restaurant and a bridge with a museum. One designer even wants to put a disco on top. Uh, exactly what we had hoped happened and did happen, that the best minds in the bridge community worldwide got together, thought about this, and in separate, in some cases, many firms did get together, but we received 25 very innovative proposals. As proposals for a new bridge filtered in, the Technical Advisory Committee investigated the condition of the four main cables of the Williamsburg Bridge. Their study, conducted in conjunction with Columbia University and the engineering firm of Steinman, Boynton, Gronquist, and Burtzall, tested the durability of the wires in each main cable. Their results differed with an earlier study which called for the total replacement of the four main cables due to extensive corrosion and loss of strength. The uh, Steinman Columbia study differed from the Stanford study mainly by virtue of the amount of sampling that was made of the wires. We sampled wires from throughout the cross section of the cable, not only on the surface but right into the center of the cable. 
uh, taking 32 samples at each of five locations. And this made it possible to see the, the uh, relationship between the condition of the wires and the surface as, as, as it uh, went toward the center. That made a, created a very different picture. To get to the cable wires, the engineers made a daring decision. Split open a main cable by removing the splay casting which holds the over 7,000 cable wires together. I remember the day in January when we removed the splay casting, which we were very frightened about. There's something you don't do every day in a suspension bridge, and if you're not careful, you can watch the bridge unravel before your eyes. So a very delicate operation. We took all traffic off the bridge and removed the splay casting and was successful. And when we opened it up, we found that the deterioration was not directly under the splay casting. It was kind of right at the seam of the splay casting meeting the wires as they spread out, which is great news. It's a miracle that the cables have lasted as long as they have. I wouldn't have the courage to use bare wire today in a cable like that, but certainly they had succeeded in keeping the cable in, in uh, much better condition than I would ever have expected. Having found the cables safe and actually stronger than most cables and suspension bridges built today, the Tentacle Advisory Committee turned their eyes toward a new solution. About the same time, early January, we said maybe there, are, there is a middle ground option. We were considering just a new bridge or rehabilitating the old bridge. Was there a middle ground solution of a reconfigured bridge that could provide the standard features that the feds were looking for and uh, still save the existing bridge? This was when we started thinking the cable might be savable. As the Technical Advisory Committee studied replacing, rehabilitating, or reconfiguring the bridge, the Steinman firm continued its inspection of the 11,000 steel beams of the 85-year-old structure. We were called in to do a biannual inspection on the bridge, and we began that around last December of 87. And because of the winter conditions, we decided to uh, begin our inspection on the main on the main suspended portion of the bridge because there are travelers underneath and you're somewhat protected from the elements. And in that inspection was being pursued as a normal biannual inspection and uh, we found uh, reasonable amounts of corrosion and the like. Uh, nothing extraordinary. And then as spring came along and we moved on to the approaches and to the side spans is where we began finding uh, what we call flag conditions, conditions that have to be immediately remedied. Numerous holes were found in steel floor beams, leading to the complete closure to traffic on both outer roadways in early April of 1988. Repairs quickly began in hopes of restoring regular traffic flow. New steel beams were fabricated and installed to replace corroded ones. On April 11th, after holes and cracks were found in the floor beams supporting the subway tracks, all train service crossing the bridge was suspended. With only 45% of the bridge inspection complete and 30 flat conditions discovered, chances were high that more structural damage existed and questions of public safety began to arise. What happened, uh, I was in my office and uh, I got a call from uh, Sam Schwartz who had gone out uh, in response to a field engineer's call saying that I had better come because it was a serious, uh, serious situation. And, uh, we found deterioration under every single roadway when it w there was a high statistical probability that we'd find many locations with that kind of deterioration. As we proceeded with our inspection, however, we found more and more flag conditions to the point where on April 12th, it we found these extreme corrosion on the uh, floor beams supporting the uh, BMT tracks. And that led then to a closing of the entire bridge. There was massive corrosion, and uh, everybody looked at that, peered at that, uh, uh, climbed up on the roof of the uh, chicken uh, market so you could even get a closer look. And uh, we stood there looking at this and everybody had seen enough and then walked back across the street uh, to the police station, the police muster room, uh, where uh, we sat in uh, what were like children's uh, schoolroom desks. After listening to the discussion, I asked them, I, I said, we well, you know now we have, we've closed uh, three roadways already and taken tracks off. How do we answer the question, is it safe? 
how do we know it's safe? And the issue was, that was the gravest issue because at that point only 45% of the bridge had been inspected, 55% had been uninspected. So we really didn't know uh, what we'd find, and we'd found 30 flags uh, at that point. And we, the conjecture was we might find 100 more which meant that we would be in very serious trouble on the bridge. We couldn't guarantee safety. And so at that point, I picked up the phone and I called the mayor and told him what, uh, what the situation was. I described that there had been a discussion and that, this, and that it wasn't completely unanimous, that there was some thought that we could still leave it open. And the mayor said, don't worry, not to worry. He said, to close it. That's what you should do. Behind us right now, the officials from the Department of Transportation are holding a press conference updating us. Just about a half an hour ago, the bridge was closed. 100,000 cars pass over it every day, 420 subway cars. The bridge is 85 years old this year, and rust and a lack of maintenance has taken its toll. Right now, we're going to join this press conference and talk to the Commissioner of Transportation, Ross Sandler. Uh, we announced a technical advisory committee to review the question of whether the bridge can be saved or whether it needed to be replaced. And uh, part of the and the inspections that are going on right now are part of that year's worth of uh, labor to de decide that issue. There are 10,000 steel members in this be in this bridge. Uh, we looked at about 4,500. We found 30 that have cracks in them. We don't like that ratio. There's too much unknown there. What we're more worried about is what we don't know on this bridge. 5,500 steel beams we haven't looked at. 30 out of 4,500 is not the kind of ratio that would allow us to keep this bridge open. For the first time in history, a major New York City bridge closed completely. Whether it would ever open again was unknown. Democratic candidates were running hard in New York City today, or rather, walking hard. Jesse Jackson walked across the closed Williamsburg Bridge, saying it's time to rebuild our cities. The whole uh, drama intensified of what was going on, uh, the work intensified. We had the scrutiny of the entire world now on us. At that point, with the entire bridge closed, it became an emergency situation and we were directed to perform then an accelerated uh, program of inspection. 34 inspectors descended on the closed bridge. Workers quickly began repairing flag conditions and painting to protect against further deterioration. But no matter how quickly the city moved, public outcry from neighborhoods on both sides of the bridge rose to a fevered pitch. Businesses suffered when the link between the Lower East Side and Williamsburg was severed for the first time in 85 years. There was a great feeling of panic and, and a terrible depression set in. Uh, as one looked, at, uh, looked around the area, you, you saw uh, streets that were absolutely, um, it looked, like, it looked like, like a ghost town. We've been in business for 53 years and have been very successful all along up until the situation with the bridge occurred. From the time that it closed, that's when we, our business fell off about 50%. Both sides of the bridge were hurt by the closure. And it's very important that this bridge is open for the whole benefit of the city. We found it a very uh, trying time to, to keep our doors open because business was severely affected at first. When the bridge closed, we knew we had to take care of the people on both sides of the bridge. On the Manhattan side, the problem was parking and getting people to the Lower East Side for shopping. On the Brooklyn side, it was getting people to work. We knew immediately that we wanted to have a ferry. Once we settled on the location, we then brought in our dock building crew, which we also have in the Department of Transportation, and they built a dock. They brought a scow in, placed it, uh, anchored it into the location, drove piles, built fences, we brought in tents, we paved the street, we put a traffic signal up, street uh, signs and, uh, and markings on the street where they could walk, changed bus routes, made and designed signs, and that first day we carried about 7,000 people. In 72 hours, a dock was built, and people in Williamsburg once again had direct access into Manhattan. On the other side of the bridge, in an effort to lure shoppers back to the Lower East Side, parking spaces were added in the center of Delancey Street. But despite the efforts of the city to minimize hardships caused by the bridge closing and the race to repair and reopen the ailing structure, 
Many in the affected communities remain skeptical of the Technical Advisory Committee's intentions. Wayne Saida, who was selected by local leaders as community representative and who attended all Technical Advisory Committee meetings since January, best sums up the suspicions of the people of Williamsburg and the Lower East Side. Originally, they felt that it was closed in order to shove a new bridge down our throat, that they were trying to create a feeling that the bridge just couldn't be fixed at all and you know, we would have to accept it. And we had a meeting there very night, both in Manhattan and over here in Brooklyn. And they, we gave them a warm Brooklyn welcome and let them know that we wanted the bridge back in service. And, you know, this didn't convince us that you have to have a new bridge. In quick response to the public outcry, the Department of Transportation reopened two lanes of traffic only six weeks after the closing. After eight weeks, subway service resumed. Business picked up. There was an immediate, an immediate reaction. Now with the bridge back, things are starting to resume as normal. A vast improvement. Oh, I've picked up a lot. I outlook that the area is going to be good, thriving, everything should be well. Hopefully the worst is over, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, good economic times. Still, the original problem remained. Whether to rebuild, replace, or choose the middle ground solution of reconfiguration. On June 1st, at a three-day retreat in upstate New York, the Technical Advisory Committee met to consider their final recommendation. Their discussions concluded that rebuilding the bridge was too expensive and might lead to the demolition of homes and businesses. Reconfiguration was also dismissed because of high costs. Rehabilitation was deemed insufficient because both approach roads had deteriorated beyond repair and required replacement. Because each of these options had significant drawbacks, the committee developed a fourth solution which combined rebuilding and rehabilitating the bridge. We needed a, a bridge that would go on, a hundred year bridge. And uh, it was clear that if we just tried to repair the approach roadways, we could not guarantee the public a hundred year bridge. There'd be interruptions at some point in the future. Perhaps 20 years from now, we'd have to come back. And that led us to one conclusion, that the approach roadways had to be completely demolished new approach roadways had to be put in their place. In terms of distance, 63% of the bridge would be new, and 37% would be the suspension bridge, which can be saved with some additional work. We compared that uh, with the cost of a new bridge, with the time of a new bridge, and the new bridge would take many more years. There could be environmental battles, uh, at least three to four hundred million dollars extra expense. When you add the money together with the time, there was no reason not to save the existing bridge. It was a very clear, easy decision to us. So uh, we came to our conclusion. We presented it to the mayor in early June after our retreat in, uh, up in, upstate at uh, Mohonk. And uh, the mayor was delighted when he heard it. I have some good news today. The preliminary results of the Technical Advisory Committee are in. The Williamsburg Bridge can be saved. Following an exhaustive study, the committee has found that the main span of the bridge and the supporting cables are fundamentally sound and after the needed work can continue to serve as the heart of the bridge for at least another 100 years. The community is very happy with the panel's decision and very supportive of it. And I'll certainly defend it be in front of anyone else who wants to do something else with the bridge. We're actually quite surprised that they came out in favor of repair. But I think one of the most important parts of the process was that the community was brought in from the beginning, so that we were able to make our concerns felt before things were written in stone and before it was too late to do anything else but fight and sue each other. And on behalf of the Southside Coalition, I wanted to present to the uh, Technical Advisory Committee a plaque in appreciation for the work that they did. And the plaque says, presented to the Williamsburg Bridge Technical Advisory Committee in appreciation for saving our bridge and preserving our homes and businesses from the Southside Coalition of Williamsburg. I want to say on behalf of the community that we really do appreciate the time and the effort and the honest approach that the committee took with the question. And it's a marked and happy difference than some of the experiences we've had in land use decision making. And the work of this committee is something that will always be remembered in the Williamsburg community. Well, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. for your participation. Some people blasted us saying this was politics over engineering. In fact, this was probably the best engineering the city had seen since these bridges were first built. I am, uh, I am delighted with uh, the work of the Technical Advisory Committee. 
uh, with what is, has accomplished in such a short period of time and the end result. Uh, here is a group of uh, 10 engineers that uh, got together for a period of 10 months, uh, worked uh, very well together, came up uh, with a unanimous decision. And these are world-class engineers, each with different opinions with, from different backgrounds. They came to the same conclusion. And the conclusion is one which will save the city, the state, the federal government hundreds of millions of dollars, will save the public years in terms of construction. I can't imagine a better outcome. The lesson of the Williamsburg Bridge is that uh, if you don't take care of the bridges, you end up in the crisis which we saw on the Williamsburg Bridge. On the other hand, if you do what's necessary, paint them, maintain them, clean them, do the, the periodic work, uh, maintenance that needs to be done when it's needed to be done, then the bridges should last literally forever. And uh, that's a very great lesson for the city to learn. So uh, you have to reach back in history uh, very far to find uh, work as important as what has just been accomplished by the Technical Advisory Committee for the Williamsburg Bridge. After 10 months of intensive work, the Technical Advisory Committee and the New York City Department of Transportation saved a major city landmark. The Williamsburg Bridge will stand for centuries to come.